Welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Ajil. خانم آقایون درود به شما امروز مهمان عزیز من آقای مهداد سرلک هستن مرداد جان خیلی خوش اومدی به برنامه آجیل و خوشحالم که امروز با ما هستی امین جان افتخار منه که اینجا در کنار شما و بینندگان عزیزتون هستم واقعا از از سپاس بذارم که این فرصت و وقت رو من دادی که با هم بشینیم و گفت رو کنیم ممنون مرداد جان از سنین خیلی کمی میخوام شروع کنم از وقتی در ایران بودی شما در ایران متولد شدیم. و در سن جوانی با خانواده با آمریکا مهاجرت کردیم چه خاطراتی از ایران داری و یکم برای ما این خاطرات شیرین و حتی ممکنه ترد باشه اینا رو شهر بده قربونه دارم دقیقا درست کفیم جمعه متولد تهران هستم ایران به دنیا آمدم و به سن هفت سالگی ما من و پدر و مادرم از ایران مهاجرت کردیم و آمدیم آمریکا. برای ادامه تحصیل پدرم ایشون خواست اینجا دکترا شو بگیره و قرار بود که برگردیم ایران خاطراتی که من در ایران دارم والا به اون سن که آدم در یه جای زندگی میکنه اکثر خاطراتش در ارتباط با خانوادهشه و مسافرت هایی که میرفتیم من پدرم اهل علی بودرس هستم و خیلی از خانواده پدریم در اصفهان زندگی میکنن و علی بودرس و اینی که ما بین تهران و اصفهان تهران و علی بودرز مسافرت زیاد می رفتیم حتی شمال یادم یه بار رفتیم خاطراتی که دارم اکثرا با خانوادم و با دختر خاله ها پسر خاله ها پسر دایی کازینا بالاخره دیگه میدونی که در ایران چهار چهار جور ما میتونیم بگیم کازین بله با با اماها خاله ها اموا دایی ها و با خانواده پدر مادر پدر بزرگ مادر بزرگ اکثر خاطراتم با اونها است و واقعا ایام شیرینی بود و یه چیز دیگه ای که هست همینجا من تک فرزنم خواهر بردر ندارم اینه که میتونم بگم که همیشه این یه جوکی بود بین پدر و مادر و من و اون اینه که خونه ای که با توش زندگی میکردیم اونجا خواهر و برادر و ایمان من بود از عاشق اون خونه بودم و یه خونه تقریبا بزرگی بود برای سه نفرمون و به قول مادرم من اونجا شالتاق میزدم <laughs> از سمت راست به چپ حیات بازی میکردم و همه سر دست من بود اینه که یه خاطرات بسیار شیرینی از, از خونمون دارم جایی بود که بزرگ شدم از اون دوستایی که اطراف, اطراف اون محیط زندگی میکردن که فقط یکیشون بعد از میتونم بگم سی سی و خورده ای سال از طریق فیسبوک با هم در تماس هستیم و همو پیدا کردیم و خیلی واقعا شیرین بود فیسبوک خوبیاش این چیزها هم هست واقعا آدم دوستای قدیمیشو پیدا کنه. خانواده شما مرتا جان مثل خیلی از خانواده های هزاران هزار خانواده دیگه مهاجرت کردم به،, به آمریکا در وقتی که شما واقعا یک بچه بودین و زندگی جدید شما در آمریکا از وقتی که مهاجرت کردین چه جوری شروع شد و پایه گرفت بالا همونطور که اشاره کردم ما به دلیل ادامه تحصیل پدرم آمدیم آمریکا و اولش که آمدیم قصد موندن رو نداشتیم اینی که به یه حالت موقت یا حداقل طرز فکری من شخصا موقعانی کودک این بود که خب ما یه مدت آمدیم اینجا پنج سال دوره دکترا رو بگذرونیم و بعد خب برمیگردیم ایران و این یه حالت از لحاظ عاطفی و فکری حالت دوگانگی ایجاد کرد چون هم در این حال اینجا بودیم و بالاخره زندگی رو اینجا داشتیم تشکیل میدادیم و هم در این حال تو ذهنم همیشه این فکر بود که ما ما برمیگردیم ایران اینه که میتونم بگم از این حاز خب خیلی راحت پایه گرفت برای من من کلنی آدمی هم که شخصا با تنه خیلی زود خودم رو وفت میدم به اون محیطی که در زندگی میکنم خیلی ادفتیو هم راحت خودم رو وفت میدم به اون محیط جدید و دوست پیدا میکنم و آشنا پیدا میکنم و میرم جلو و یه حالت کاوشگری دارم دوست دارم برم جلو کشف کنم پیدا کنم بیابم و خودم رو جا بدم در محیط جدیدم. ما اولش هم که آمدیم اینجا آمدیم دنور کلرادو و بعدش رفتیم پورتالس نیو مکسیکو که اونجا پدرم فوق لیسانسشون رو گرفتن خیلی سریع زبان انگلیسی رو یاد گرفتم قشنگ یه خاطره دارم که دو سه ماه بیشتر نبود که با اینجا زندگی می کردیم داشتم با آقایی صحبت می کردم و یادم یه یک کن کوک دستم بود داشتم کوک می خوردم و داشتم حرف می زدم برای خودم ارزندام می کردم به سن هفت سالگی و این آقا گفت شما که شما محل کجاین از کجا آمدین گفتم که ایران گفت چه مدت آمدی گفت دقیقا نیادمه گفتم سه ماهه گفت خود تو که انگلیسی خیلی خوبه گفتم آره خوبه خیلی باهوشم <تصفيق> همینطوری بهشین رو گفتم و یه همینجایی تو صدا خاطره خیلی جالبی دارم درباره آمدن به آمریکا 
که عجایب آمریکا برام بود یکی این وندینگ ماشین ها این دستگاه ماشینی که میتوش پول میندازی و حالا یا نوشابه یا قضا یا مصداق یا هر چی اینا برای من خیلی جالب بود چون خب به سر هفت سالی که تو ایران ندیده بودم همچین چیزی رو و هی میرفتم اینا رو نگاه میکردم دوست داشتم هایستم مردم که پول مینداختن این, این ابزار که ازش میفتاد برام خیلی جالب بود اون این حالت فنری بود که این فلر میچرخید و اون حالا هرچی که خیلیم میامد یه دوبار میفتاد فکر میکنم بنیاد مهندسی مکانیک هم از اونجا شروع شد که این چیزا خیلی علاقه داشتم مسئله دوم هم این درای اوتوماتی این مسئله خیلی برای من جالب بود که احسن شما وقتی میرفتی یه گروسری سور یه مغازه خوابا کرشی به درک میرسیدی خودش باز میشد و من میشه سریع رو بررسی میکنم میگفتم خدای این به چه دلیلی از کجا میدونه که این بعد باز شه و حدس میزدم یه چیزی تو زمین وزن آدم رو حس میکنم خیلی کنشکا بودم و این زمان برای خیلی جالب بود نوجوانان معمولا در سراسر سر دنیا واقعا همیشه آرزوی دارن که به دانشگاه های عالی و معتبر برن مخصوصا در آمریکا چون در آمریکا خودت میدونی که واقعا یکی از بهترین دانشگاه های دنیا اینجا هستن آیا این آرزوها برای شما هم وجود داشت در اون سنین کم؟ اصلا اصلا چیزی که به فکرش نبودم این بود که یه روزی میرم دانشگاه یا یه روزی ازدواج میکنم یا میدونی وقتی شام به سن سالی که هستی مدار فکری و دنیا تقریبا خیلی محدوده در همون حد فکر میکنی اصلا به فکر دانشگاه نبودم تحصیل برام خیلی مهم بود چون من هر دو هم پدرم هم مادرم هر دو آموزگار بودن در ایران و تحصیل خیلی در خانواده ما مهم بود و تحصیل کردن با سواد بودن مخصوصا حفظ زبان فارسی فوق العاده برای مادرم مهم بود برای پدرم هم مهم بود یادمه که مادرم میزد زیر گریه میگفت این الان بعد سر کلاس باشه تو ایران پس ما الان اینجا که هستیم این زبان فارسی یادش میده و من خودم هم خیلی فوق العاده تعصب داشتم که این زبان از از دستم نره و فرهنگ و زبان فارسی و اصالت ایرانی بودن در خون من از ابتدا وجود داشت و خب امروزم که الان 34 سال اینجا هستیم حتی قوی تر از روزای اول ولی نه همین جا هیچ وقت فکر نمی کردم که روزی دانشگاه آمریکا چون گفتم تقریبا تو ذهن ما این بود که ما برمیگردیم حداقل چندین سال اول که دیدیم که نه واقعا جور نمیشه و نمیتونیم مویسر نیست برگردیم کاملا کاملا در ذهن ما این بود که خب من برمیگردم ایران و به نظر می رسه که شما بر نگشتین و اپلای کردین به کالج و شما به مؤسسه تکنولوژی ماساچوست پذیرش پیدا کردین که از واقعا میشه گفت پر بزرگترین دانشگاه های تکنولوژی دنیا میشه گفت به MIT در باستن در مهندسی مکانیک و لیسانستون رو اونجا در مهندسی مکانیک شروع کردین یک کمی شرح بدین در این چند سال به شما چی گذشت و چجوری زندگیتون نوز شد داده یه اگه اجازه بدین یه داستان خیلی کوتاهی در ارتباط با پیدا کردن و کش کردن MIT بشه من از تقریبا میشه گفت از سالی که وارد دانش یعنی میشه گفت مدرسه شدم چه در ایران چه در اینجا هر سال در کلاس های متفاوت هم شاگرد اول میشدم و یه چیزی بود تقریبا برامون عادی شده بود دیگه میوادم میگفتم خب این سالم دوباره شاگرد اول شدم من دیگه تقریبا به سال اول های اسکول که رسیده بودم یعنی سال کلاس دهم ده رسیده بودم کاملا در ایالت که اونجا زندگی میکردیم اون موقع نورت کدا بود بیزمارک نورت کدا در پای تختش ما اونجا پدرم شوق گرفته بود و به اونجا نقل مکان کرده بودی میشه گفت به حالت نامتناقض و به حالت ثابت برای من نامه میامده دانشگاه های معتبر ممتاز هاروارد، سنفورد، امایتی حتی که لطف کنید شما اونجا اپلای بکنید بیا این دانشگاه ما رو بررسی کنید و البته پذیرش نامه نبود همونطور که می‌دونید تازه این دانشگاه وقتی به تام میگن که به ما نگاه کن هیچ شانسی نیست که شما قبول شید چون بهترین از سراسر دنیا این جوجه ها میخوان برن ولی خب من در اصل فکرم به این بود که خب یه دانشگاه خیلی ممتاز میتونم برم ولی واقعا فکر امایتی رو باز نبودم چون میگفتن امایتی دیگه از همه‌شون بالاتره و یه چیز حالت فوق‌العاده‌ای داره بعد سال کلاس دهم ده بود که من پدرم رفته بود یه شهر دیگه داشت تدریس میکرد مادر من برگشت بودن ایران برای یه ماه و یکی از دوستای ما منو دعوت کرد خودم 15 سالم بود دعوت هم کرد که گفت حالا که شما الان تنهایی بیا اینجا شام با ما و چند تا دوستامون هم هست یه آقای اونجا واقعا تصادفی بود که ایشون فاکتور تحصیل MIT بود و تو نقطه تو خودم فاکتور تحصیل MIT خیلی کم داشتیم تصادفا ایشون مال MIT بود و گفت من کاملا تو رو پیگیری میکنم اسمت اسم تروس تو روزنامه چاپ میشه تو اخباری تو تلویزیونی و میدونم چه کارهایی داری میکنی و میدونم شاگرد اول شدی و فلان مسابقه رو بردی اینو بردی تو هیچ وقت فکر کردی بره ام‌آی‌تی من فکر کنم جای تو ام‌آی‌تیه که بهش گفتم والله نه ام‌آی‌تی خیلی فوق‌العاده است ولی فکر نمی‌کنم 
او خیلی منو تشویق کرد گفت که تو من فکر کنم اشتباه میکنی و تو صد درصد اپلای بکن و توازنامه بده و هیچ گارانتی تضمین نیست که قبول شی ولی خب صد درصد این کارو بکن و اینی که از اون موقع من به این فکر افتادم که خب پس من اصلا دیگه باید برم ام آی تی و تقریبا همه تمرکزم افتاد روی این مسئله و خب این سعادت رو داشتم که قبول شدم و رفتم اونجا اون چهار سالی که بهش اشاره کردی هم اینجا افرادی که میان ام آی تی از سراسر دنیا طبق آمار خودشون دو دهم ده درصد ممتازرین شاگردای دنیا و اینی که میتونی بگی از هر جای دنیا که میای شما شاگرد اول بودی بهترین بودی در منطقه خودت ولی وقتی میری اونجا مقابل بهترین از دنیا قرار میگیری و هر کسی که باهاش سلام میکنی اونم شاگرد اول بوده اونم بالاترین مسابقه های نمیدونم علمی و ادویکیشنی رو برده و شما یک شده و یه حالت وحشتناکی داره چون هم رقابت فوق العاده بالاست و هم میزان و سطح احترامی که برای دیگران قائل میشی فوق العاده بالاست چون میدونی که هر کسی که هستی خیلی هستن که ازت بالاتر بودن و اون اون حس اونام رو تو داره دقیقاً متقابلا خیلی جالبه و خب البته ناگفته نمونه که دیگه از لحاظ تدریس و پروفسورها بهترین پروفسورای دنیا چقدر برنده جایزه نوبل و مخترع و سی ای او دیگه یعنی واقعا میشه گفت پخته ترین مقصدهای دنیا از این راهروهایی که ما قدم میزدیم عبور کردن و واقعا میشد بگم که هر روز که من بیدار میشدم و میرفتم سر کلاس به قول اینا میگه آدم خود رو بهش کن میگیره نگاه میکردم به این ساختمونا به این تومارا به این ستونها و میگفتم که من دارم تو MIT را میرم و اصلا باور نمیکردم چون هنوز خودم رو در اون قالب بچه هفت ساله میدیدم که از ایران آمدیم و چون این قول برگشتم به ایران واقعا میشه گفت برابرده نشد این حالت همیشه در من بون که من به همون سن موندم و خودم رو به همون سن میدیدم و میگفتم نگاه کن من الان هفت سال هم دادم <تصفح> الان ببینم کجا رسیدم خیلی برام جاله بود خیلی سخت بود رقابت فوقلاده زیاد بود ولی میتونم بگم که برای اولین بار توی عمرم و هنوزم همینطوره یه حس آسایش و آرامشی از لحاظ خوشی و فکری به هم دست میداد چون همه اون کسایی که اونجا بودن و باشون کار داشتم در سطح خود من بودن از لحاظ فکری خیلی عمیق بین خیلی دور بین مسائل به سرعت درک میکردن میتونستم بشکافن و دلیلی نبود که مسائل خیلی پیچیده رو براشون بشکافم خودشون متوجه بودم <تصفيق> تو های سکول که بودم و بعد توی اتفاقا بعدم که از اماتی پاپ تحصیل شدم یکی از جوکایی که دوستام همیشه به من میگن میگن که مرتا توی فانتوم نشسته و این 24 ساعت بعد ترمز بزنه که ما بهش برسیم یه حرفی رو که مثلا میزنه ما نیم ساعت بعد متوجه میشیم بعد صبر کنه برای ما بهش برسیم و این اتفاق هیچ وقت تو اماتی نمیافتاد و بالعکس من همیشه بعد میدویدم که همیشه کیپ اپ بکنم و با حرف دیگران هم واقعا بتونم کیپ اپ بکنم خیلی جالب بود یه تجربه فوق العاده ای بود Let's uh, switch to English now and uh, so far we've been talking about your childhood, we've been talking about your adolescence and we've been talking about your poise and passion for education and always being a straight A student but not really having the ambition to go to Ivy League schools but you did, you did go to MIT, you ended up uh, uh, getting your uh, bachelor's in mechanical um, engineering over there and then uh, after MIT, Corporate America welcomes you to Minnesota to one of its, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of its uh, great companies, Honeywell, uh, from Minnesota here. Tell us about that transition and uh, coming out of that Ivy League school with, with, with the mindset that you just spoke about and coming into corporate America, putting on a suit and tie and going to work uh, just like everybody else. Yeah, it's actually funny that you say suit and tie because back when I graduated, you did wear a suit and tie to work. Yep. You know? yep. Now everyone's casual, business casual, and, and there's no more suit or tie. Right. Um, You know, it's interesting when I when I graduated from MIT. And you mentioned the the ambition. Really, the the ambition when I was a kid, I never thought about it. But I definitely did have the ambition when I was in high school to go there, and was was proud to be accepted. But you know, when I graduated from there, uh, I remember the first when I came out. Of course, I'm just beaming with pride and excited. And when you go to a school like MIT, it's kind of like going to Florida State for football. <laughs> you know, a lot of recruiters show up and they want to hire you. So I had the good fortune of having a lot of offers from some of the best companies in the country. General Electric had nominated me to their Edison program, which is uh, an award they give to the top 50 graduates across the nation. Um, I had Allied Signal had actually made me an offer to time uh, Bull Worldwide, Polaroid, Procter and Gamble. So I had a lot of fantastic opportunities, and Honeywell. And you know, I had I had gone to high school in North Dakota, so I was very familiar and comfortable with the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And I went and interviewed at all these different companies, and they were all they were all just fantastic. And it was a really really difficult decision, and I narrowed it down to Honeywell and GE, and, and there were many reasons why I did. But 
But, you know, one of them was that GE had this lockstep program that kind of dictated to you what your future was going to be. And I'm an explorer. I like spontaneity. I like control over my own destiny. And Honeywell seemed to offer that. And, of course, it was a fantastic company. It was much smaller than GE at the time. Uh, but, you know, I felt comfortable. And when I came to Minneapolis, I really liked the city of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. I had honestly kind of grown a little tired of the crapness of Boston. Mm -hmm. And I wanted open spaces. And, and uh, you know, the other thing was is I was always in the back of my head a finance major in addition to engineering. Mm -hmm. And I did a quick calculation. And, and the cost of living in Minneapolis was significantly lower than Boston, than even though the coast. salary offer at the, mm -hmm. at the time was, was roughly equal. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what, I'll come to Minneapolis for a couple years, I'll work for Honeywell for a few years, I'll save up some money, and then I'll go back to Boston and I'll you know, finish my master's degree at MIT. Mm -hmm. That was really the plan. So uh, that, that's 20 years later, I just celebrated my 20 year anniversary with Honeywell and proudly so, so that clearly did not come to fruition. Right. But that was really the plan. And I remember the first day I went to work, You know, I, was, uh, I graduated when I was 21, and I went to work, and I have my briefcase and my suit and tie, and as you said, and I walk in. And it's a huge, it's a facility that's 1.2 million square feet. Uh, it's the largest controls manufacturing facility in North America. And, and it was daunting, you know. And I, I mean, it was, you walk in and you think, I'm 21 years old. Yes, I just graduated from MIT, but what am I going to do? You know, wh what am I supposed to do today? What's my job going to be? And, you know, you just don't know until you really get into it. And um, uh, there were some butterflies at first first half a day, mm -hmm. and then as I mentioned earlier when we were speaking Farsi, I'm a very adaptive person by nature, so whatever environment you give me, um, I just click into it, and it really didn't take long to click in and make friends and figure out that you know I was going to perform here. So you start working at, at, at Honeywell, and after being promoted several times at the company, you're nominated by Honeywell's senior leadership to pursue your master's, and you're admitted to the prestigious CDTL program at the University of Minnesota. Uh, to get your MS in management and technology. Right. Uh, take us through that journey um, of, again, being a full-time, and I, I really want to emphasize on this point, of being a full-time worker and, again, a straight-A student, which is very hard to do, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's 30 years ago or today. Tell us Thanks. how you did it. So, yeah, you, you, you nail it exactly right. I moved up the ranks in engineering pretty quickly. I, I designed and patented uh, a product that went into production in North America, and I solved some pretty pretty challenging technical problems for Honeywell at the time. So I got promoted pretty quickly. But at the same time, I realized that by the time I was in my sort of 26, 27 age range, I started to notice a shift in corporate America where a lot of engineering jobs and technical jobs were moving overseas. We, we ourselves were setting up what we call low-cost design centers in the Czech Republic and Korea, you know, China, India. And I started to be concerned that, you know, if I stay in engineering, my job might be outsourced, you know, in the next few years. And, you know, the other part of it is, and, and, and you know, your viewers who work in corporate America will appreciate this, but when you move up the ranks in a large corporation, oftentimes what happens is you get promoted out of the thing that you really love to do and enjoy doing. And I had moved into program management by that time. I was still the design engineer. I was, I was working uh, in an advanced technology group doing some really, really great things. But I was also doing a lot of management not, and less engineering. It was a lot of, you know, paperwork and, and managing, which mm -hmm. wasn't really the kind of engineering work I wanted to do. So I, I thought to myself, when I got nominated, I, I thought, this is a perfect opportunity for me to diversify my skill set, educational background, because I saw the path in engineering as maybe not going somewhere that, from a marketing market standpoint, was going to have a lot of demand or maybe, again, fewer jobs in the future. And I just wasn't doing as much engineering mm -hmm. when I was managing. Mm -hmm. So I accepted the nomination. They, you know, they picked two people out of the division. It's a really, really big deal because it's an expensive program. And of course, the company you know, pays for the whole thing. And you are. You're going to school full time. It's a lockstep program. It's for executives in training. So you're going to school for all day Friday, all day Saturday, and it alternates. Um, and you're working full time Monday through Friday. And you still have to carry your workload. And, and really, at the time, I, I had moved into co-running an advanced technology group, um, and so I was doing a lot of international traveling, mm -hmm. and uh, it was crazy because sometimes I'd be gone out of the country Monday through Friday, Thursday, I'd have to come back and be in class all day and, you know, sit and do that, so it, it was it was tough, but I've always been good at juggling multiple things, and the other thing you might be interested to know is at that same time, I developed a passion for the entertainment industry and acting, mm -hmm. so I decided to enroll in an acting program at the same time, so I was working full-time getting my executive MBA, a master's degree, and also I was in an acting program, and I was traveling overseas. <laughs> and we'll, get back, we'll get back to the acting here, but let's first talk about the President's Club. So you have won the highest achievement award for your functions within a company of 150,000 
uh, employees uh, three times, three times in five years. I mean, yeah. that's unprecedented. What is your secret for success? And <laughs> why don't you tell us all so we all do it? You know, I wish I wish there was a secret for success. First of all, I appreciate you saying that. It's it's very very humbling. I just uh, was uh, was informed on in January at our at our kickoff meeting uh, uh, in Orlando this year that that I was uh, you know awarded again this year as well. So very very humbling deal. You know, you get a lot of exposure within the company, and I'm just kind of beside myself. But you know what? I'll I'll tell you what. Um, I I can't say there's a secret, but I'll tell you the things that that I do. Um, when I approach a problem. Uh, I approach it from a fundamental standpoint. I look at the root cause of the issue and, and I go for the root and I solve it at the root. And if you can become a problem solver that eliminates problems, not just resolves them, you become indispensable to your company and, and people start to take notice because you know companies are always cutting back on resources. They don't want to throw money and people at a problem. They want it to go away. And you know my mindset, and this was very much fortified at MIT, and it was actually fortified again in my master's degree, but on a business standpoint, I always come at a problem, whether it's technical, whether it's business, whether it's individual, I always come at it at what are the fundamental principles that are causing and contributing, what are the variables that are contributing to this problem, uh -huh. finding those, rooting them out, uh -huh. and redesigning the system so that those problems don't continue to repeat. And when you do that day in and day out, and you consistently resolve things, and you solve really big problems that other people sort of get challenged with, people take notice and, and they reward you for it and life rewards you for it. Um, so that, that's definitely one aspect of it. And the second aspect of it is that I, and this is my nature, you can't really teach this. You either have it or you don't. I genuinely care about the things that I do. I don't do everything. There are a lot of things that I say no to. But if I say yes to something, it's because I'm genuinely passionate about it. I genuinely care about it. And when you care about something, you put everything you have into it. And the people that you're working with or across from or against recognize that. And they respect you for it. Mm -hmm. And when you do solve the problem, the rewards that come back are a lot larger. Mm -hmm. So whether it's, it's solving a technical problem for a customer, when they see that you really, really care, mm -hmm. even if something isn't perfect down the road, they give you a lot of credit and they give you a lot of leeway because they're like, this person really genuinely cares. Um, and that's the other thing that you know I, I really do bring to the table. I'm a consummate communicator. You know, you and I, I, I know that you're the same way, and I appreciate that in people. I don't back away from a challenge, and I don't back away from confrontation. I, I remember in our master's program, one of the things that we went through is secrets of, of success, and I remember the number one item was people who don't back away from confrontation. Because it, it's really, if something happens in life, there's constantly confrontation. There's always conflict. And if you're somebody who just sort of turns and walks away from it, mm -hmm. you are by definition going to lose. Absolutely. And a lot of times, just by facing the problem and not running from it, you're going to win 50% of the battle because half the time, the person you're battling against is going to walk away. It's not even there. It's like, it's <laughs> like not going to court and your opponent doesn't even show up. They don't show up. Yeah, you win. Yeah. Right? You talked about uh, the wonderful world of arts, acting, producing, directing, filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And apart being an outstanding corporate executive, uh, as you are in the science and technology world, you also had the hunger to exercise your artistic side, and you briefly mentioned that uh, earlier. Tell us about this passion and when it started, how it started, and where it's going. Well, that's a great question. So one of the things we didn't mention was when I was in high school, uh, I was a concert violinist. I played in a professional symphony. I was accepted at the international music camp, and I was a concert master two years in a row. And that, at the time, was also unprecedented. Nobody had mm -hmm. gone back to back and was concert master. So I was, I was what a lot of people would call a gifted, um, accomplished violinist. Mm -hmm. So I love performing. You know, as an only child, you're around adults and you're constantly sort of performing mm -hmm. <laughs> because you have to entertain yourself. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so entertainment, performance, being uh, you know loquacious and, and having the ability to talk and perform was always in my nature. And I was always a mischievous child, and I, I you know acted out in school. I acted out you know around my parents. Um, and and so the violin and being able to play in front of a large crowd of eight thousand people at the Civic Center or whatnot was something that I loved. It was a huge thrill for me. You know, I, I, I loved it when the orchestra would be seated and I'd be in the back and they'd you know call my name and I'd come out and everybody would stand up and I'd get to play a solo. I loved it. So I loved performing. I loved making people happy. I loved sharing the arts and mm -hmm. you know I just intuitively was gifted with the with the with the mathematical mind. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that I also had an artistic side as well. And even though I tend to lead with my logical mathematical mind, mm -hmm. um, I'm very creative in nature. Mm -hmm. Even when I was a, an engineer. 
I went into I was a design engineer, which is a very creative aspect of engineering. I wasn't a, a process engineer, which is very sort of uh, rigorous and process oriented. So I had this performance gene in my blood, is the point. And um, and kind of in my by my mid to late twenties, I realized I can't go back and play the violin because that would mean I'd have to give up my corporate career. And, and you know, if you're gonna go play in a symphony, that's a full time thing. Mm -hmm. So I started to look for other venues and other outlets where I could express my creativity. And um, and I remember. Every time I'd watch TV, I'd watch people doing funny skits or making, you know, goofy expressions or commercials where, you know, somebody would kind of have the odd expression. And I would think, I could do that. I do this all the time. I make people laugh all the time with my expressions. So, and people used to joke with me. They're like, you should do stand-up. So I thought, you know, why not this? Why not me? Why, why couldn't I do this? And, and the other part of it, and this might kind of sound funny to you, but... You know, I had enjoyed a, a very lengthy series of successes in life, which was which was amazing and it was humbling. And I was kind of looking at some for something that I was frankly going to fail at. And and I thought, let me pick something that there's no way acting an Iranian in America at that time. This was you know well before 9/11, so they weren't doing all these you know movies where they were casting Persians and Arabs and Armenians and the Kardashians didn't exist. So you know the idea of an Iranian actor at the time was just unheard of. And, and I thought, for sure, I'll fail at this. So that's when I enrolled, and that was the same year that I got into the CDDL program at the U of M. Yeah. Um, and uh, I enrolled in acting, and, and I thought, let me just try this. There's no way this is going to work. And lo and behold, I went to the acting program. I landed uh, uh, an agent, which is the top agency in Minnesota, uh, Susan Wayman, uh, Talent and Models, Wayman Agency. And they called me back, and they said, you know what? There's a lot of commercial work they're doing. We, we don't have a lot of people with your look. We've got a lot of Scandinavians. Uh, we need somebody with your look, and uh, let's give you an audition and a try. And it kind of took off from there. So awesome. Um, awesome. awesome. So in the in the past few years, you've been um, cast in two films, wrote a screenplay, uh, and you're producing a movie. Right. How? Um, tell us a little synopsis about 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 how uh, all of that happened. Well, uh, so when I, you know, I, I spent two years in Minnesota pursuing acting, and, and I sort of peaked there because there's only a limit to how far you can go. And with my master's degree in hand, with the job opportunity to move out to the West Coast, mm -hmm. and with my new passion for acting and a class mm -hmm. behind me, I moved out to Los Angeles. I was going to say that I, the hub for, for this type of industry is usually the West Coast and Los Angeles, so you did the right thing by just uh, by relocating. So Yeah, I, I'd been playing a chess game to put all the pieces together, mm -hmm. and it all came together at the right time. And when I moved out here, I had the educational background, mm -hmm. I had the master's degree that allowed me to move out of engineering. I had the, the acting background and I had some experience, so I was able to hit the ground running in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, you know, I landed an agent within a few years. I got my SAG card, so I became a professional actor, Screen Actors Guild. And you know, with an agent, she sends me out on auditions uh, when I'm not traveling for Honeywell or when I'm not doing other things. I, I go out and audition when I can. And um, you know, I landed uh, these two movies in the last couple of years. One of them is called Barracuda, and, and it's I think it's out on the uh, DVD and pay per view. And Sinbad, The Fifth Voyage, which is actually premiering uh, February seventh um, in theaters nationwide. And I went and I auditioned for him, and I uh, you know was cast in the roles. And uh, you know, we went and we shot, and I, I just made it work. I juggled it with my schedule, and and it was amazing. He is called the White. He is a dark wizard who drinks the souls of the innocent and thrives on their energy. My spies have told me that you have been meeting with my daughter in secret. Only what you mind. Most men find it all together. Also worked on the television world and uh, landed a contract with Andy Shea International TV as a host and producer of two different live TV shows. Uh, right. They have a broad viewer um, ship across the globe. 
Uh, we're going to switch back to Farsi here. Jamei Irani, I'm sure you know, by television, and the show is very popular. And you are certainly many times on that television. I myself have seen many times on that television. And the show is on YouTube. The clips you have are very popular. One of your experiences on television and the show and the things you have seen with the people you have met. Let's talk about it. Thank you. 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 خیلی علاقه من بودم که با جامعه ایرانی بیشتر در ارتباط باشم و یکی از اهداف همین بود که با پیشاندانم با هم بطنانم بتونم یه ارتباطی از, از دنیای قرب به دنیای شرق ایجاد بکنم و پیگیری کردم ببینم چه کانال های تلویزیونی اون موقع خیلی ممتاز بودن و تلویزیون اندیشه به نظر من اون موقع شماره یک بود اندیشه بود و تپش هم بود و من با تلویزیون اندیشه تماس گرفتم و بهشون گفتم که من خیلی علاقه مندم با اینکه هیچ تجربه ای در این زمینه نداشتم هیچ وقت در تلویزیون زنده کار نکرده بودم کارهای میزبان و هستیم و انجام نداده بودم ولی خب حس میکردم که شاید استعداد این کارو داشته باشم و با یه ذره تمرین کارم بگیره اون موقع آقای پرویز کاردان که یه نام بسیار بله. شناخته شده و کارشناس هستن ایشون واقعا اسطوره تلویزیون و فیلم ایرانی هستن آقای پرویز کاردان مدیر عامل تلویزیون اندیشه بودن و من براشون اپلای کردم و طریق اینترنت و بعد از این مدت کوتاهی با من تماس گرفتن و گفتن که آقای کاردان میخوام با شما ملاقات بکنن و خلاصه با ایشون ملاقات کردم و بعد از حدود نیم ساعت ایشون به من گفتن که شما کار تو تلویزیون میگیره من الان 50 سال دارم این کار رو میکنم و نام بردن با فلان کس فلان فرد خانون و اشوره داشتو من تمام این افراد آوردن تو تلویزیون و میدونم یه کسی که اون به قول اینا فکر رو داره کیه و تو داری و تو حتما بیا تو تلویزیون و اون موقع برای من یه برنامه رو تراحی کردم به نام سفر عشق یه مصابقه بود و این برنامه تقریبا به دو سال و نیم به طول می انجامید و برنامه خیلی موفقی بود که هر هفته می رفتیم و سوالا هم خودم می نوشتم تهیه کننده و نویسنده و میزبان خودم بودم با خانم منای مکی هم کوهست من بودن اون موقع خلاصه این برنامه حدود دو سال و نیم بود روی ایر بعد سری تغییراتی در اندیشه صورت گرفت حدود شاید میشه گفت یک سال تو تلویزیون نبودم و خیلی نبودم و بعد دوباره با من تماس گرفتن گفتن که ما با مدیریت جدید و برنامه جدید میخوایم شما و یه تعداد خیلی کمی رو برگردونیم <تصفيق> که بعد اون موقع از من سوال کردن که چه برنامه رو دوست انجام بدی گفتم حالا من چون خودم اون موقع دیگه تو کارهای هالیوود و فیلمای هالیوود و آمریکایی افتاده بودم گفتم خیلی دوست دارم که دنیای هنری ایرانی جامعه آمریکا رو به بقیه دنیا و به ایرانی ایران معرفی بکنم و اسم برنامه رو گذاشتم From East to West از شرق به غرب و دلیلش هم اینه که کره زمین به این جهت میچرخ از شرق به غرب میچرخه و از اینکه برنامه های فرش و قرمز رو اینجا داشتیم با هنرمند های ایرانی در همه زمینه ها چه موزیسین، کارگردان، نویسنده، هنرپوشه، نقاش هر چی که فکر میکنی در زمین های متفاقه مهمان های ما بودن ویدیو های هفته رو پخش میکردیم میرفتیم گهده های آن لوکیشن در اون مکان عمل برنامه کنسرت بود یا افتتای فیلم بود فرش قرمز بود یا تو خود استودیو خلاصه خیلی از هنرمندای ایرانی که کارشون تو هالیوود گرفته بود تو دنیای موزیک گرفته بود به بقیه دنیا معرفی می‌کردیم و بالعکس هم اینجا خیلی از آمریکاییایی که برنامه‌های ایرانی تهیه می‌کردن می‌نوشتن اونا رو هم می‌آوردیم تو برنامه که در ایران بدونن که کار ما واقعا میشه با هنرهای ایرانی در آمریکا گرفته و رو به رواج We have a surprise for you. So as if corporate awards, the multiple corporate awards that you won, and the acting, and the producing, and the writing, and the hosting on live TV was not enough, you went even <laughs> further in your conquest, and you launched the business uh, that started from a simple thought. I remember you telling me this. It started from a simple thought in a, in a supermarket, and that business thought that started from, from you know just scratch paper probably Uh, mm -hmm. has become a very successful dating website and app called Cupid Radar. And uh, you are the founder of CEO of Cupid Radar. It's a popular site. Uh, and I want you to take us through that journey from inception to reality and tell us what went through your mind. Well, you know, this is uh, Cupid Radar's uh, a baby. It's been my baby for, for a long, long time. And as you said, when I moved to Minnesota, um, I remember I was at a grocery store and I was just sitting there and I was watching people pass by. And this attractive young lady walked by and I remember thinking, 
I wonder if she's single. Yeah, I wonder if she's seeing anybody. And and I wonder if she'd be interested in, in me, for example. And what was interesting about that was, you know, people wear wedding rings uh, if they're married. But there's no way that you tell the world that you're single. And I remember thinking, what if there was a technology away? And this is 1993. So there are people the internet... who don't wear wedding rings who are single, so you got to watch out for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't always tell from that. So you need something more interactive. And remember, this was 1993. There was no internet. I mean, there was. It was just at the right. basic elements of it. You yeah, know, websites really weren't that prevalent. There was no smartphone or apps that didn't even exist. So I remember thinking, how do I use technology, which was my own background, how do I use technology to introduce people who might be single in a given area? And so I had this idea. I thought, well, maybe you come up with a shirt. You wear a shirt that says, hey, I'm single, but I thought no one's going to wear that. That's ridiculous. What about a keychain or a necklace or a watch that sends a beacon out that says, hey, I'm single, and if you're single and you walk by, your watch beeps. But it, there was just no easy way to do it. Color displays weren't prevalent, didn't exist. So I, I really had to wait about 18 years for smartphones, which was ultimately the, the idea that enabled this thing to become a reality, to come to market. You know, first the BlackBerry, and then the, you know, the iPhone and Android devices. Mm -hmm. So my idea then went from hardware-based to software, and that's really what Cupid Radar is. It's a software app, it's a website, and you put it on your phone, you know, your Android device, your BlackBerry, and later this year we're going to have iPhone as well, um, although iPhone users can use it by just going to the mobile site. Right. Um, and what it does is it just essentially, you know, it knows where you are because of GPS technology. Um, it, it, you fill out a basic profile, you tell us who you are, what you're looking for, you upload a picture. Um, and, and then you just kind of put the phone away and the phone searches in your radius that you determine and it says, hey, this person that you're interested in based on what you're looking for just drove by a mile away, a half a mile away. And then you, you get that indication on your phone, you see them, you send them a message, you say, hey, it looks like we're only a mile away right now, do you want to get together, have some coffee, I think you're attractive, now I know you're single. And if they're interested, they message back and forth. You never exchange phone number or contact information, and you know you meet up. So it was really the idea. There were two principles behind this that, that I'm very passionate about. One is I think that if you bring people together, you can make the world a better place. Whether you bring them together for love, for coffee, for friendship, if you bring people together, it's, it's our separation, it's our differences that cause our problems. And if we can come together, we will realize that we really have a lot more in common than we have apart. And, and, uh, and we're not all that different. And, and I think, you know, it sounds kind of cheesy, but really ultimately the, the way to make the world a better place is through love. <laughs> And that's, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make a better world. I want to make a happier world. And I thought if I could bring people together, mm -hmm. that would be one way to do it. And, you know, the other part of it um, is, is this idea of serendipity, you know, this idea of a chance encounter that here you are sitting at a grocery store, at a coffee shop, at a bookstore, and all of these people, men and women, are passing by you. Well, I'll bet you that if you could stop and interview every single one of them, which obviously is impossible, you would find that there is a connection point that you have with a lot of these people. And a lot of those people could change your life the same way that, that, that Mr. Bob, uh, back when I was 15 years old, I happened to meet him at a party and he happened to say, why don't you go to MIT? And I said, why don't I go to MIT? And I applied and changed the course of my life. Well, if I hadn't gone to that party that night or he hadn't been there, who knows? I, I might would be, be somewhere entirely different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, the idea of bringing the people together to make the world a better place and to really allow people to optimize the opportunities that are around them that are just passing by every minute, whether, you know, whether it's for love or something else, was really the driving factor or my passion behind Keep the Radar. And that's exactly what that site and app does. Finding love. It's like searching for a needle in a very large haystack. Just think of all the people who come and go in your life. Who's the one? And how do you finally get to love? Sometimes the search may land you in an office like this, talking to someone like Deanna Lorraine. Definitely what I do is help single people fall in love and I help them find the relationship or the man or woman of their dreams. She's San Diego's dating coach. You don't just want to go out to bars or singles clubs and nightclubs. There's a lot of different things that you can include in your search. Online dating. Online dating. You mean emails, calls, texts? What if you want more immediate results? So you kind of know where people are distance-wise from you right now. Immediacy is what Merdad Sarlacc is all about the brains behind CupidRadar.com 
an online dating website, but this one... Based on an uh, iPhone, Blackberry, Android, here's you type in your username and your password. Smartphones. Using GPS, Cupid Radar searches and delivers you to Destiny's door. When you issue a search, all it tells you is that this person is within an X mile radius of you. Okay, let's see how this works. Here I am now logged in on CupidRadar.com and here's my selection of guys. Okay, I like this one. Let's send him a message. I'm just around the corner, five minutes away. Do you want to grab lunch? Let's see what he says. So it definitely saves time. Um, it's a great conversation starter and it gets people meeting in real life. And getting that face time is key when it comes to the game of love. I think it's really important if you're going to meet online to take it offline as quickly as possible. Destiny gets you close across the street, but we're the ones that bring you together. And CupidRadar.com, well you could even call that Destiny for Mer Dad. The idea born after spotting the one that got away. And I thought, gosh, if, if only I knew what her status was, I'd go up to her. Sharon Chen, San Diego 6 News. I'm very passionate about Iran. I'm very passionate about my country, my people, my language. You know, it's why I've stayed so close. It's why I did the TV show. It's, it's why I didn't change my name. You know, it's why I go back to Iran every chance that I get. I would love to do something that, you know, I did a TV show that brought the East and the West together. Um, I've got a lot of ideas that I'm formulating on things that I can do to bring our countries together. You know, Iran is my country, mm -hmm. but America is my adopted country. It's where I live now. Um, and I, and I want to bring these two countries. So there are a lot of things, uh, sort of, I don't want to say political aspirations, but, but sort of in that vein of bringing our countries together that I'm very interested in pursuing as well. Uh, which would be, you know, entirely different segment from everything I'm doing now, but in, but in some ways, really an extension of everything I've been doing. Because if you look at my core philosophies of of loving my country, of bringing people together, that would be the next logical step. Um, you know, I definitely think that you can bring people together through technology and art, mm -hmm. and and those are things that you know I'm continuing to pursue. I've got some other business ideas that I want to launch in the next uh, couple of years. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the arts, you know, you mentioned that I'm producing a movie right now with a uh, very well-known executive producer, Sam Pollard, and our producer's a uh, very successful Persian filmmaker, Paimoni Kadaye. Uh, we're doing this amazing uh, documentary about a family who leaves Iran uh, to come here for a better life, and we sort of follow their journey to see, you know, do they in fact end up with a better life, or is it sometimes the grass isn't greener on the other side? Um, so we're working feverishly on that to get that out, you know, hopefully at the end of this year. Um, and I've just I've got a lot of those things. I've got a couple of big TV show ideas around Cupid Radar that, that I want to do. Mm -hmm. So when you say are there surprises, boy, there's there's nothing but surprises on the horizon for me. And it's exciting because I position myself in a way where every day something crazy and exciting uh, is is going to happen, and I and I just love it. I wouldn't live any other way. نظرتون درباره جامعه ایرانی در آمریکا چیه؟ مخصوصا خانواده هایی که مثل خانواده شما من در سال 70 80 90 مهاجرت کردن به آمریکا و اینجا دارن بزرگ میشن و خودشونو ایرانی حساب میکنن با اینکه شاید هیچ وقت ایران هم حتی نرفتن. سوال خیلی جالبی و سوال پیچیده‌ای هم هست. چون میتونم بگم که از دیدگاه من الان مخصوصا در 2014 جامعه ایرانی که در آمریکا هستن به دو دو طبقه تقریبا میشه گفت تقسیم میتونم بشن. یکی طبقه ای که همونطور که شما اشاره کردی سال هاست اینجا هرگز برنگشتن ایران هرگز هم علاقه ندارن برگردن ایران یه گروه دیگه هستن که اخیرا آمدن در ده سال گذشته پنج سال گذشته دوازده ماه گذشته آمدن و آنها یه طرز فکری خیلی متفاوتی دارن چون هم ایران معاصر رو میشناسن و هم میشه گفت ایران قدیم رو میشناسن و مسئله رو که من میبینم اینه که خیلی از ایرانی هایی که اینجازه نگی میکنن با یک تصور بسیار بسیار منفی از ایران زندگی می کنم و یکی از دلالش اینه که بر نگشتن هم که شما گفتید و در خیالشون چیزایی رو که شنیدن یا شد دیدن این برا خودش گل کرده تو ذهنشون و به جایی که برن و اینو برا خودشون ببینن برا خودشون قضاوت بکنن پیشا پیش قضاوت می کنن و من خیلی وقت با افرادی که آشنا میشن که مدت تا اینجا اینجا بودن و برنگشتن بهشون میگم میگم شما این چیزایی که دارین میگین من خودم برمیگردم ایران و میبینم با چشم خودم اونطوری که تصور میکنید نیست خیلی بهتر از اونیه که تصور میکنید و بهتون پیشنهاد میدم که برگردین مملکت خودتون و به بچه هاتون هم اجازه ندین که فرهنگمون زبونمون از بین بره خیلی از خانواده که میبینم 
با هم انگلیسی صحبت میکنه و میگم شما ایرانی هستین چرا دارین با هم انگلیسی صحبت میکنید باز گفتم این به دو دو گروه تقسیم میشه 50 درصد هم اصلا اینطوری نیستن و افتخار میکنن به ایرانی بودنشون البته من میتونم بگم همه به ایرانی بودنشون افتخار میکنم من هیچ کس رو نیدم ایرانی ها کلن بغلاده فغلاده افتخار میکنن همهشون به تاریخچه کهن و زیبامون و این باعث افتخار من میشه خیلی هم دوست دارم این مسئله رو ولی واقعا میتونم بگم اونایی که مدت ها سال هاست اینجا پیشنهادی که دارم براشون که برن ایران کش کن الان رو اینترنت انقدر یوتیوب ویدیو هست که زندگی رو در ایران میتونید برای خودتون ببینید اجازه ندین بچه هاتون از فرهنگمون دور بشن خیلی خوشحالم میبینم بسیار ایرانیایی هستن که اینجا دارن فعالیت میکنن در این زمینه که فرهنگ و زبانمون رو زنده نگه دارن ایرانیایی که در هالیوود میان چقدر از ایران تبلیغ میکنن چقدر تشویق میکنن کلا واقعا افتخار میکنم به همشون و آرزو موفقیت برای همشون دارم دو تا سوالی که مرتا جان از شما من دارم و از, از خیلی از ایرانیا دارم و ممکنه خیلی تلخ باشه این سوال ولی حقیقت داره اینه که چرا ایرانیا همبسته نیستن ام. اونقدر که باید همبسته نیز نیستن ولی در تلاش های فردی در دنیا نظیر نداریم ما خودت هم اینو میدونی یعنی نمیخواد من بگم آمد. تمام مدال های طلایی که ما در المپیک میبریم یا در کشتی یا در وزن برداری این تلاش های فردیه ولی هیچ وقت بر هندبال در هاکی در واتر پولو ما نتونستیم طلا ببریم این برمیگرده به نظر من به جامعه و نظر چیه درباره این مخصوصا شما که در کالیفرنیا زندگی میکنید همینجا من دو برداشت این مسئله دارم 50 درصد کاملا اون چیزی که شما میگی باعث هم عقیدم 50 درصد هم یک زاویه دیگه رو میبینم از جامعه حالا اون الان میشکافم ایرانی ها کلن از لحاظ فرهنگی خیلی تکرو و خودبین هستن حالا این ما میتونیم برگردیم جامعه شناس ها رو بیاریم و تاریخ شناس ها رو بیاریم و بگیم که چرا در این دو هزار سه هزار سال پیش که این همه ترک ها آمدن، مغول ها آمدن، چنگیز ها آمد، اسکندر آمد و ایران رو تصرف کردن، عربا ریختن من فکر میکنم که این یه حالتی رو ایجاد کرد که مردم میخواستن خودشون رو بشناسونن به اون ایلی که ایران رو تصرف کرد که حفظ بشن یا, یا رتبه بگیرن نمیدونم دقیقا دلیل جامعه شناسیش و تاریخیش چیه ولی این حدث منه که صد درصد ایرانی ها همیشه دوست دارن وسط مر... یعنی حالت مرکزیت داشته باشن و خودشون به درخشن و وقتی که شما خودت میخوایی به درخشی خب دنبال تیم و دیگران نیستی این حالت رو من خودم کاملا هم در خودم میبینم هم در دیگران میبینم با اینکه خیلی دوست دارم همکاری بکنم همیشه وقتی دنبال کارا میرم تقریبا به عنوان یه تک فرزن خودم میرم دنبال این کارها این بخشی از فرهنگ مونه و مخصوصا فرهنگ قدیم ایرانی بخش دومی که میتونم بهت بگم اینه که من الان در ایران کاملا مسئله مخالف اینو دارم میبینم الان این صحبت رو که شما کردی شما الان نگاه کن در برای اولین بار ایران بس که دو بار یا سه بار جام والیبال آسیا رو برد جام بسکتبال آسیا رو برد تیم ساکرش فوتبالش الان داره میاد به جام چیز ورلد کاپ و همونطور که الان گفتی خیلی حالت اتحاد بیشتر داره در, در داخل ایران من این مسئله رو دارم ملاحظه میکنم خارج از ایران متاسفانه خیلی از ایرانی هایی که مثل ماهایی که از, از ایران آمدیم هنوز به سبک قدیم ایرانی که تک رو هستیم موندیم ولی داخل وارد ایران که میشه یه حالت اتحاد و همبستگی وحشتناکی در ایران میبینیم بخشی از این مسئله صد درصد دلیل سیاسی داره چون ایران محاصره بوده 34 سال ایران از لحاظ سیاسی محاصره بوده اقتصادی از لحاظ نظامی حقیقت محاصره بوده و خب وقتی که شما محاصره میشی مجبور میشی به پیوندی به طرف راست به طرف چپ و دست تو دست بریم جلو و این اتحاد رو من در ایران و در ایرانیا به یه شکل فوق‌العاده‌ای برای اولین بار در نسل از طرف نسل جوونم که این کارا داره میشه چون واقعا نسل جوون چقدر ما الان جوانای زیر 30 سال زیر 25 سال در ایران داریم و آه. یکی از دلیل های موفقیتمون هم واقعا در همین برنامه ورزشی مخصوصا که گفتی به خاطر همین هستش دقیقا همینه و شما تیم هایی رو میبینی از دانشگاه شریف که اینا به عنوان تیم میرن به جام های بین المللی در کارهای تکنولوژی و اینا شما یک میشن برنده میشن این من فکر میکنم همین جان در نسل آینده ای که بیان و یه نسلی که در آمریکا تجدید بشه این حالت خود خودپرستی یا تکروی رو به کاهش و حالت همکاری و همگرایی خیلی رو به رواجه 
Well, Merda John, in, uh, it's been a wonderful experience to talk to you today. In closing, uh, if there was one person, and I always like to ask all of my guests this question, if there was only one person that you could thank if you climbed the highest award and the highest podium in the world, and if you only had to thank one person for changing your life, who would it be, and what would you say to that person? Well, you know, I, I think it's, it's impossible uh, for you to get to where you are in your life uh, without having good parents, and and I, I've got to bend your rules a little bit, and, and you know we, we, my, we, we my, will accept mom and dad as one person. My, so my, no my mother has to be first because she gave me life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so literally she gave me life, and you know and and uh, so if you have to put it in that order, but it really well, is I'm my sure parents. Yeah. It has to be my parents. You know, uh, just like any any teenager, we went through some rocky periods when I was growing up. But, uh, but, you know, they're both my best friends. I love them dearly. Uh, they support me with everything I do. They believe in me. And, uh, you know, they're, they're my best friends. And I have a very close relationship with them. And uh, I'm grateful that I've had uh, a lot of time with them. I look forward to many more years with them. And, uh, uh, you know, being an only child, that's kind of your rock, right? That's where you go. I didn't have brothers or sisters. And uh, it's just it's great to have good parents. It's great to have supportive parents. I love them dearly. Um, and you know what's, what's interesting about your question is that what my parents taught me was to always rely on yourself. And so it, it's interesting because I've always I've been a self-starter. I've always been self-motivated. And when I want to do something, I, I kind of look inside and I say, what do I want to do and how do I want to do this? And, and so in an ironic way, I want to thank them for raising me in a way that lets me rely on myself for things that I do. I'm sure they're very proud of you. When you wake up, that's who you have. I have no doubt that they're very proud of you. And ver we're very proud of you as well. I mean, the Iranian community, for the people who grew up here, and I mean this without any uh, tarof or uh, any exaggeration, Mehta John, when I uh, read your profile, when I met you, when we spoke, and when, when I went through all your accomplishments, before even being proud of you, what I said to myself is, uh, you know, a lot of Persians moved out of Iran with their families and came to America, Canada, Europe, especially America, to build a new life. Um, and to come to the, uh, the country with all the opportunities in the world uh, and, and to be able to say sky's the limit. And I think what you have done from your young days, uh, you know, going to college, going to premier Ivy League school, um, work in corporate America, but you didn't stop there. And that's, that's, the, that's what's astonishing is that you took your mindset to a different level. Whether you make it really big in life and become a millionaire and billionaire is not the point. The point is taking your mindset off something that is already accomplishing enough in your career and exploring something else. And, uh, and a new passion in your life begins. And right now you're talking about wanting to connect to the Persian community, being closer to your roots being closer to your people and that might open up a whole new challenge and a whole new adventure uh, while you have Cupid Radar, while you have Honeywell on the site, you <laughs> might go and do something else and that is really what America I think is all about. That is why I came here. I think that's why you came here and I really congratulate you for, for um, showing the younger generation. I might be too old already to, to, to go back and start hardly, over hardly, again. Hardly. But the younger generation, you know, the 14-year-olds, the 15-year-olds who might be watching this to say to themselves, it is possible, and it has been done, and this guy did it, and we're very proud of him, Mehta John. And in closing, in closing, طبق رسم برنامه آجیل ما برنامه را همیشه دوست داریم با یک جوابی تموم کنیم. من دو تا چیز به شما میگم. شما میتونید بین اون دو تا چیز انتخاب کنی و ببینیم که یک کم اینجوری میتونیم بهتر شما رو بشناسیم. عالی عالی عالی. خب شروع کنیم. آقا is it uh, which one do you prefer, Scorsese or Coppola? شام و سینما یا تئاتر و پیاده روی؟ آه شام و سینما فرهادی یا مخمل واف؟ اوه آه that's tough فرهادی گرامیز or آسکرز؟ آسکرز چاکلت or فلاورز؟ اوه دارک چاکلت شان پن or دانیل دی لویس؟ اوه واو دانیل دی لویس Mac or Android? <laughs> That's easy, Android. <laughs> original screenplay or adapted screenplay? Oh, original. Darius or Ebi? Um, Ebi. Westwood or Glendale for good show look <laughs> That's easy, Westwood. <laughs> Golzar or Radan? 
او گلزار لحجه رشتی یا لحجه ترکی لحجه ترکی For a good night out Santa Monica or Malibu او Santa Monica Documentary or short film Documentary گل شیفته یا لیلا هاتمی لیلا هاتمی And my last question Cake یا آجیل او How about cake and آجیل Awesome Awesome مرداد جان اسپن ا پلیجر تو تاک تو یو واقعا ازت سپاسگزارم که امروز با ما بودی و این فرصت خیلی خوبی بود که ما شما رو بشناسیم با شما صحبت کنیم امی جان ثانک یو سو مچ ایت واز مای پلیجر تو بی اون یور شو آی جاست وانت تو کنگراتولیت یو فور وات یو ار دوئینگ یو ار کیرینگ دی تورچ یو ار دوئینگ ا گریت جاب یور شوز ار سو پروفیشنال یو ار سچ ا پروفیشنال اند اند فور انی بادی دتس ورکینگ ویت یو دی وود بی ایبل تو واوچ فور دس از ول بات آی اپریشییت هاو ایزی یو ار تو ورک ویت هاو وات ا پلیزنت اند پلیجر یو ار consummate professional and uh, I love the center that you're doing Aji is beautiful uh, I appreciate you introducing people to the Persian community you know you and I are very connected in that way um, and I wish you nothing but the best and, and you can absolutely you usually sit on, on the other side of the camera now you're on the it's, other side so I it must love be, it I it love must it. be you're awkward a, you're so you're such a professional I, I should I should come and take tips from you you're amazing thank you <laughs>